Recently, I watched the video introduction of Google Gemini, which concluded with a never-seen-before logo animation. There was confusion about whether this might be Google's new logo. I only cared about how to recreate it in After Effects. We're gonna update Google's Gfavicon to its new look, then reveal it, then add an edge glow to it, and finally surround it with a spectral volume light to match it as close as possible with the original logo animation. In this exact order, I would typically present my tutorial, which would be the boiled down version of what I had figured out before. Then I would teach it step by step. But actually, when I create or recreate something from scratch, that also includes detours, failures, dead ends, changes of mind, and of course, successes. And that's exactly what's interesting about it, and from which you can learn a lot for your own projects. And that's why I'm not only gonna show you the techniques to recreate Google's kinda different logo animation, in this cut-down original recording, you can follow the ups and downs of my initial development journey and my thought process behind it. Let's jump right into After Effects. To recreate the logo animation, I had the original logo animation on the left and my workspace on the right to have an instant comparison. But when I needed it, I also could turn on the reference below my elements so I was able to closely trace and match the original animation. I downloaded the Google Jeep Heavycon from one of the numerous websites that offer the vector file for free. In Illustrator, I prepared the logo file so that I also could import the separate layers for each color element into After Effects. The reason is that I always like to have the maximum options when creating something in After Effects. However, it later turned out that I didn't need them anyway. Equipped with all the necessary assets, I was ready to animate. And I started with the Google G matching the scale at the beginning and at the end of the animation. To closely match the animation in between, I moved the keyframes, played around with the keyframe velocity, moved the keyframes again, and tweaked the keyframe velocity once more until there was an almost 100% match. Happy with my first animation, I moved on to recreate the look of the blended colors. The obvious method was to apply a fastbox blur effect. To retain the sharp edges, I applied the CC composite effect with a transfer mode set to stencil alpha. A faster method is to use the set matte effect, but the problem with that is when you duplicate the layer, the set matte effect always refers to the initial layer. I increased the blur radius to have the colors nicely blended. But the more you blur it, the more transparent the logo gets. That's why I applied a curves effect to it with the alpha channel selected and moved the right control point to the very left. Because the result looked pale, I added a lumetry effect, increased the saturation and the exposure. Very nice. For further treatment and to hide the effects used for the edited logo, I wanted to pre-compose it. But with the help of a new solid layer and the calculations effect applied to, I simply copied the logo layer into this solid layer and turned off the original layer. This way, I had instant access to the parameters whenever I needed to change them. This comes in very handy for me when I experiment with the values. With these preparations done, I went on to something that I was really looking forward to, to recreate the spectral volumetric light. First, I tried different effects, even paid plugins. Deep Glow produced a really nice glow, but I couldn't further increase the radius to the composition's border. Then I tried Crate's free God Rays plugin. Also cool, but it produced unwanted spikes. Maxon's Optical Glow, also a powerful glow plugin, somehow didn't get the colors right, and it also faded out too soon. With Sapphire's S-Glow effect, I didn't really get along somehow. And Trap Coat Shine wasn't the right choice. So I tried a native effect like CC Radial Blur, which looked promising, but was too spiky and too weak. Just one effect further on the list, I finally found the perfect effect. CC Radial Fast Blur. When I applied it to the logo, the usual issues occurred. But when I switched the zoom from standard to brightest, boom. It resulted in what I wanted. The colors looked almost identical with the reference, a bit too saturated though, but nothing you can't fix. With this successful discovery, I could comfort myself and put it aside for the time being to tackle the logo reveal next. The logo reveal could be accomplished with a simple write-on effect. 
but to make it as accurately as possible, I used the technique I already made a tutorial about, and which works best for geometric, sans-serif typefaces like the Google G Favicon. I took the outline and offset it inwards to get a perfect centric line. And I could trim the line to use it as an alpha mat for the logo. I traced the path animation, always comparing it with the reference. And because I was happy with the animation and no further experiments were required, I pre-composed the reveal so I could easily apply the CC radial fast blur effect to it. I also added a fast box blur effect to the right on alpha mat to feather the reveal like in the original. This changed the reveal animation a bit and so I had to adjust the end keyframe to get it in sync with the reference. To intensify the colors, I duplicated the logo layer along with the alpha mat layer. I wanted to get rid of the little remnant caused by the blur effect by masking it out, but because masks usually don't work well with the calculations effect, I left it as it was, simply because I was too lazy to fix it. An important detail is the edge glint that sparks the logo reveal. The good thing was, I could make use of the outline path to let it move along the edge. To do this, I first deleted the segments I didn't need. And with the path selected, I opened the Create Paths from Null Script window and clicked on Trace Path, which created a null layer moving along the path. The problem was, it was totally offset. To fix it, I could have zero out the layer anchor point and the transform group position like here, but somehow that didn't come to my mind. So I did the quick and dirty way and just moved the path layer manually. Because the original glint didn't start exactly at the ladder's corner, I had to extend the path a bit to match the position. Then I matched the animation by moving around the keyframes, adjusting the keyframe velocity and playing around with the animation curve. Next, I created a new shape layer, added a rectangle and parented it to the null layer. I added a pucker and load path operator to create a four-pointed star. But immediately after, I changed my mind and used an ellipse instead as a base shape because the glint started as a small circle in the reference. So I not only animated the rotation, but also the pucker and bloat amount starting with the value of zero to let it kick off as a dot. And because in the original it disappeared shortly after the start, I also animated the ellipse's size. To let the glint glow, I set its color to white, created a black solid and applied a native lens flare effect to it. But I soon found out that it wasn't the right choice. Instead, I duplicated the glint shape layer and deleted pucker and bloat. As the round glow lived a longer life than the glint, I shifted its last two size keyframes towards the end of the reveal. I could have used any of the glow effects, like deep glow, but I decided to apply my super glow preset to it, which mocks the physically based deep glow or optical glow with native effects. I added a fast box blur effect to soften the glow. Then I offset its position to let it move below the logo and not along the edge. As for the glint shape, I blurred it a bit and set its blending mode to screen. I liked the result, but discovered that the original glint didn't exactly follow the cornered outline, but moved along a curved path instead. I wanted my glint to behave the same and rounded the corner of the path. To round things off, I tinted the glow. Another subtle detail I noticed in the reference was the fine edge glow that appeared at the end of the animation. I also could have used the light sweep effect, but I wanted to solve the task with the duplicated shape layer I used for the glow. Maybe it was a more complicated method, but it already had the animation curves that made it sync with the other elements. I deleted the effects of my glow preset, expanded the Google G and used it as an alpha mat. That was not quite what I wanted, because with this technique I couldn't taper it. I still didn't want to use the light sweep effect and made a second try with another complicated method. I took the animation path I used for the glint, trimmed it down, animated the offset, tapered the stroke, made it synchronize with the round glow, added a simple glow effect to it and blurred it out a bit. Looked great for me. But because the original edge glow emerged and disappeared towards the end of the logo reveal, I also animated the stroke width. Perfect. Having saved the best for last, I was ready to complete the volumetric light animation. 
Applying CC Fast Radial Blur to the Logo Reveal Precomp gave me this result. First, my volumetric light was in sync with the reveal, but it wasn't moving ahead like in the original. Second, my version of the volumetric light applied to the complete logo, whereas in the reference, it occurred only at the tip of the growing favicon. To fix this, I first duplicated the reveal precomp dedicated to the volumetric light so that the logo animation itself stayed untouched. Then I animated the start attribute of the trim paths operator, but slightly shifted in time. Via trial and error, I tweaked the keyframes and shifted the layers until the volumetric light behaved like in the original. I animated the opacity at the beginning because the light emerged a bit later and set additional keyframes at the end of the reveal to let it disappear. Then I added a hue and saturation effect to reduce the saturation and softened the edges with a fast box blur effect. Because the frame in the reference was completely filled with the fog, I duplicated the layer and increased the blur even more, but lowered the opacity. Just when I thought I was done with the logo animation, I realized that I overlooked the rotating stars in the background. It seemed to be a static image with no depth. I created a solid layer, applied the CC Particle System 2 effect to it, set the gravity to zero, the particle type to shaded sphere, reduced the birth rate and the particle's birth and death size, made them white and even smaller. Because I didn't need the particles to be animated, I precomposed the layer and freeze framed it in the midst of the timeline. And then I parented it to the logo layer to adopt its scale animation and animated the rotation, taking over the keyframe velocity values of the scale. I also copied the opacity keyframes of the volumetric light, pasted them into the stars layer and shifted the last keyframe. The stars appeared simultaneously with the volumetric light, but disappeared a bit later. Finally, I also checked the motion blur checkbox. I could have wrapped up the animation here, but as a perfectionist, there were two things that still bothered me. First, there was the problem of jagged edges in the logo caused by the alpha curves. I solved it by putting the clean logo on top and setting its blending mode to stencil alpha. Second, the rotation of the glint became hectic when it moved around the corner. I first thought that I had to adjust the rotation value and the easing, but this didn't change anything. I soon figured out that the null object the glint was parented to followed the path tangentially, making the glint additionally accelerate. To fix this, I disabled the rotation expression so that the null object didn't change its orientation, and thus didn't influence the glint's rotation anymore. One very final touch, because the original glow was bigger and brighter, I duplicated the glow layer, scaled it up, and lowered the opacity. And on that occasion, I matched the glow color. To me, color, brightness, and size closely matched the reference. And that's it guys. I hope you liked this tutorial. See you next time. By the way, you can download this project file and get my Super Glow preset if you support me on Patreon. And yes, I'm in a hotel called Motel One in Stuttgart City, Germany. Just Google it. <laughs>